Okay, so what I'd like to do next is have Rob Shupansky talk about a uh, case that uh, he was uh, the prosecutor in uh, that went uh, to trial in Allegheny County. He'll introduce the background of the case, the, the legal issues, uh, what his approach was, and so on. And then I'll talk about the case in the context of the DNA evidence and then show you what was shown to the jury as we go through slide by slide of how this was explained in court. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I know many of you out there, for those who I don't know, my name's Rob. I'm um, uh, in the homicide unit here at the district attorney's office. And uh, the case I want to talk about is the case of Cleveland Davis. Before I get to that, um, your registration forms, the course title is New DNA Analysis Method. And I just want to point out, um, new does not mean novel. Uh, the case of Commonwealth versus uh, Kevin James Cole, and it's a uh, published opinion of the Superior Court dealing strictly with true allele. Uh, its site is 38 Atlantic 3rd, 882. Um, it basically said that what true allele was doing was using not novel methods, it was just using what has been done, statistics and DNA in, in a, a new way using computers, but it's not something that was new and it's cited as, as evidence. In the middle of my trial, um, Dr. Cole and I were meeting for a possible, um, a possible fry hearing, basically. We had another county that said that true label was, was uh, a good method that we could use in court, but not Allegheny County. So in the middle of, of uh, our preparation, this opinion came down, which solved our issue here. I just want to let you know about that. Now, the Leland Davis case, um, it happened, the murder of Tamir Thomas happened on October 25, 2008. It happened in McKeesport, Walnut Street. Tamir Thomas was an individual who uh, was at the Elks Club. It was used as an after-hours bar. Um, so it was a little, the shooting happened a little after 3 a.m. Uh, Tamir was uh, actually forced to go out for someone's birthday. He did not want to go out that day, um, but he was, it was, his friend was insistent, so he went out, and uh, when the club was closing, he was walking down the street. Um, the bouncer remembers him exiting, turning left, and walking uh, towards 12th Street in McKeesport. Uh, there was a crowd of people. Uh, Officer Harrison was an officer that was assigned for crowd control. When the club went out at 3 a.m., he was there to make sure there weren't any, wasn't any problems, wasn't any trouble. So Officer Harrison was actually parking his car on 12th Street, getting ready to do the crowd control as Tamir was walking towards that direction. Now, through a crowd of people came the shooter and placed the gun towards the back of Tamir's head and shot him once. Um, Officer Harrison heard the gunshot as he's exiting his vehicle, looks up and sees a man running with a handgun and running towards him. He orders him to stop, but the assailant didn't stop, kept running. Officer Harrison begins to chase him. Now, during this chase, a black hat with pinstripes falls off the person's head. The person's running away, slips on some gravel, and when he gets to the gravel, slips and drops a gun. So we have a hat and a gun. The person, the person kept running and got away. Now in front of the Elks Club was a shell casing that was found, and later a bullet was taken from the head of Tamir Thomas. And video was collected from inside the Elks Club. The detectives looked at the video and found what resembled the hat on a person. We didn't know who he was. Fast forward a little over a year later, November 17, 2009, the gun lab came back and matched the shell casing that was in front of the club to the gun, to the bullet inside of, that was found inside Tamir Thompson's head. So we knew we had the murder weapon that was lying there. That was the gun that was used. We had a video, and stills were made of the video, but we still didn't know who this person was. Now, in July 8th, on July 8th, 2010, a witness on an independent matter who was from the Keysport area and knew lots of people in Keysport 
was being interviewed about a completely different incident. And a detective who was familiar with this case saw how familiar she was with everybody and decided, let me show her a still from that video. And she knew who that was. She said, that's Leland Davis. I know him, I know friends, I dated friends of his. So we went and got a buckle swap for his DNA using that identification as probable cause. Now the DNA came back, and it came back to both the hat and the gun. But as Dr. Perlin mentioned earlier, it's common to get mixtures. There were three people on the hat and three people on the gun. Now, Leland Davis's DNA from the crime lab was 1 in 420, and on the hat was 1 in 5.7 quadrillion. Now, in analyzing the data, I began to speak to Dr. Perlin about what do we do about the mixtures. Because during this investigation, we found that a Dominic Haynes was given the gun. We found the gun owner, and the gun owner said, I gave that gun to Dominic Haynes. Now, could he be one of the people who's additionally on that mixture of three? So as Dr. Perlin indicated earlier, it's not only inclusion. I asked him that he could get better numbers, if he could use all the data to see what, what the match statistic was on Leland Davis. I also asked him, can we exclude this person who a witness said he gave the gun to? And then lastly, um, those two issues were the comparison of individuals to the evidence. That's what we commonly do. We compare some item to some person. I asked Dr. Perlin, in this case, we have a hat and a gun. And if you looked at all to the list of cases that we did here in Allegheny County, it was the only one that had two pieces of evidence that were separate. I asked him if he could, through his methods, look at the evidence and say that Leland Davis was the only person common to both. If you can compare evidence to evidence, not evidence to a person. And he did that as well. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Perlin to explain how he did that and what the results were. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As Rob mentioned, there was a homicide at the Elks Club, and there were two items of biological evidence. Uh, a gun and a hat. Uh, the DNA analysis was done by the crime lab, and they produced uh, excellent data for both the gun uh, and the hat. The human review results that were reported uh, from the uh, Allegheny County Medical Examiner's Office uh, produced a strong match statistic on this three-person mixture uh, for the hat with numbers in the quadrillions using a CPI method. Uh, but on the gun, using CPI, uh, the numbers uh, were more like 420. And uh, Rob had a, as I recall correctly, had a definite sense in this case that he wanted two items of DNA evidence, not just one, for this particular trial. So the question was, what is the true match information of the evidence to the suspect? That was the first question. Back in Oakland, uh, once cybergenetics received the data from uh, the medical examiner's office, we received electronic data as a short tandem repeat evidence data. And these come in electronic files. Each file is the result of one experiment that can look at 15 different locations at the same time uh, on different uh, chromosomes using different dyes in different size ranges. And one file contains all of those signals in a standard format uh, that uh, the manufacturer publishes so anybody can read the information in those files. For each item, uh, Cybergenetics ran replicate true allele computer runs. And these were three unknown mixtures. And the, and the genotypes, the genetic types, for each of the three contributors was separated out. And uh, because of the nature of the DNA, where there was degradation and some of the contributors were more degraded than others, that means there's a chopping up of the DNA. And some of the DNA from uh, one or two of the people was more chopped up than uh, from others. 
that was considered as well. And the result was that evidence genotypes were inferred by the computer and they're known and they're recorded as probability distributions. The reason for this is that in science when there's uncertainty, uh, if you have the mathematical methods and computers to back it up, then you can represent that uncertainty with probability. The alternative, as you've seen with human review, is to just throw it all out. And that's not preferable if there's something you can do with it. We generated a true allele report. And the way to think of the match statistics is that you're combining genotype information from three different sources. You're comparing the genotype from a contributor from the evidence, like the gun, relative to a genotype from some, someone or something else, uh, for example, a defendant or someone you, uh, you might want to exclude or from another piece of evidence, relative to a third genotype, which is coincidence from the random population. That also has a random genotype, the chance of randomly selecting somebody from a population. Putting those three things together, the evidence, the uh, defendant, and the po random population, uh, truly obtained a match statistic uh, to Leland Davis. The statistics for the hat were about the same uh, in the quadrillions. Uh, uh, but for the gun, the statistic was appreciably higher in the tens of billions. And one of the reasons for this was that uh, that contributor that Mr. Uh, Davis matched was a major contributor that comprised over half of, of the DNA and so it was much easier for the computer than had he only been 5% of the DNA, which would have resulted in a lower match statistic. To prepare for trial, uh, Rob and I met a number of times. I prepared a case report. We went over the direct examination. I developed PowerPoint slides, slides to show uh, in court, which you're, you'll see in a few minutes. And uh, Rob had a lot of homework, background reading, uh, which he thoroughly enjoyed, enjoyed, he told me, uh, learned a lot. And there were other questions and other meetings. As Rob mentioned, he asked for two other reports because he had two other questions. Was Dominic Haynes uh, somebody who had previously handled the gun in the DNA evidence? And we uh, submitted a report that answered no. There was a factor of a million against his being in there. You can view that as saying that it was a million times less probable that he contributed his DNA. This is something that uh, these computer methods can provide, is to put numbers to exclusionary evidence. Uh, and then we also asked the question, or Rob asked the question, is there anybody else in both DNA items, both in the hat uh, and the gun? And I'll show you how we answer that uh, at the end. But the answer was no, Leland Davis was the only one. As Rob mentioned, uh, he was uh, fortunate enough to have the uh, Foley precedent come down uh, months before the trial. And so there was no need for an admissibility hearing because there was an appellate precedent uh, since uh, affirmed by the, uh, the Supreme Court of the state. And now let me walk you through what the jury saw in terms of the computer interpretation of quantitative DNA evidence in the Commonwealth versus Leland Davis case in August of 2012. So the place to begin is to briefly explain what a DNA genotype is, because that's what people have in their biological materials, in their bodies, and the evidence that they leave. It's genotypes or mixtures of their genotypes. So for an understanding, the jury needs to know what a genotype is. This picture shows one of the 23 chromosomes. I usually describe uh, the DNA inside of a nucleus as an encyclopedia uh, with 23 volumes. Each one's a different copy. And you get two different copies, one from each parent. And they're in each cell that has a nucleus. A genetic locus is one paragraph in one of those volumes. It's a particular location that you uh, that a person can read, or scientists can read, if they have the right reading apparatus, which they do in their laboratory. There are two DNA sentences. There's one from each parent. And an allele is the value that's at that paragraph. These paragraphs are chosen to have variation in them so that they can be used to distinguish people. If the paragraphs never changed, you couldn't distinguish people. 
So the amount of variation is maybe 10 or 20 different paragraphs that can be distinguished from each other. And a, a simple experimental technique that was devised um, over 25 years ago is called short tandem repeats. And that's based on length variation. Uh, what happens is there's a DNA alphabet. And the letters in the DNA alphabet are A, C, G, and T. They correspond to four different nucleic acid bases. And in the, in the, in the cell, those letters, A, C, G, and T, are used to write sentences or entire encyclopedias. And they work very much like text in a book, or I guess nowadays a hard drive. But it's linear. It's information. And that information can be translated uh, by a cell and used to operate a cell. This information is largely junk DNA. It's, it has no known purpose. It's just there maybe for some evolutionary reasons. And there are length variations. So at this one location, there'll be a segment of, of a four-letter word, like TCAA, that's repeated some number of times. Could be five times, or six times, seven times. Could be 20 times. The number of times that it's repeated is the allele. It's that number like uh, 10 or 12 that we saw before. It's the number of repeats. Generally, the values are different, just randomly, of what you get from the mother, or your mother, or what you get from your father. Those paragraphs have different lengths. But that's the main variation. And the pairing of those alleles is the, is the genotype. That, in fact, that's just true in general in genetics. The pair of alleles for eye color or for any other gene uh, is the genotype. And by having many different alleles, there are many different pairings of alleles, typically over 100 at one location. And so if you have 15 locations, that's where you get these trillions of trillions of possibilities. That's what a genotype is. DNA evidence interpretation conceptually is the same, whether it's done by man or machine. On the left, we begin with an evidence item. I've indicated. Uh, two different people by two different color DNAs to indicate a mixture. The lab processes the biological evidence that contains that DNA with all the genotypes encoded inside of it and produces evidence data. There are again, 10 or 15 different locations. Each one has its own signal. And here we see two low signals for 1011 and a taller signal for 12. The fact that there are three alleles and not two uh, indicates scientists that it's probably a mixture. It's more likely there's two people in here or three. And then based on that data, an inference can be made about the evidence genotype at this one chromosome location for each of the different contributors. Simple methods will just draw a threshold. But uh, what a computer program can do, if it, has, if it has the math and the time, is it looks at all the data from all the different loci sort of simultaneously. And it tries out every possibility. And when it's done, it, out of those 100 possibilities, it may be left with only three possibilities that have appreciable probability. For example, a 10-12 genotype with 50% 50, 50 probability, or an 11-12 with 30%, and so on. All of this is done objectively without ever looking at the comparison genotype. When the computer works on this, it does not know Leland Davis's or Dominic Haynes's genotype. That's only done afterwards, after the computer has stopped, written down what the answer is as a probability distribution on its hard drive, and then signals that it's completed and more review can be done. Later on, a person or another computer can make a comparison from this probability genotype it's trying to capture all the information in the data, not add to it or subtract to it or throw it away, uh, and make a comparison with a known genotype to form a match statistic. Computers can use all the quantitative data. In this case, uh, we see there are five peaks, which since you can't get really most of the time more than two for alleles from each individual, this indicates a three-person mixture. There are quantitative peaks. The heights make a difference. That's a little bit of one person. That's a lot of another person. The pairing having same height is important because it indicates it's more likely that the 16, 17 allele pair came from one person 
whereas the minor contributing with a 1415 on the left with shorter peaks came from someone else. The x-axis is the length of the sentences. And the y-axis is showing how much is there. Notice how the pattern is giving a lot of information that you don't have from simple presence or absence of peaks. People use less of the data. They draw a line, and the short, shorter peaks and the taller peaks are now all treated the same. All combinations of those events have to be considered together, even though some of them are really not feasible. If you look at combining a 15 with an 18, that's really not going to happen under most laboratory conditions. You're not going to get a very small peak combining with a very tall peak. The genotypes come from certain amounts in pairs from certain amounts from certain individuals. Also, this data, which is probably real data, is not considered by the method. So if this minor contributor happened to correspond uh, to some, a person of interest, you'd never find it. The result of all of that discarding of data is a diffusion of probability. Instead of using all the data to concentrate the probability and ultimately the match statistic on what the evidence is trying to tell you, instead, it considers all possibilities, many of them completely impossible, with equal weight. What the computer does instead, as I explained to the jury, because you already know this, right, is that it tries out every possibility. So imagine that the blue corresponds to one individual, and that's their allele pair. So there's a lot of a 16, 17. And orange corresponds to a minor contributor, and there's another allele pair of a 14, 15. And there's yet another individual who may be there in a very small amount as a 21, 21. The computer moves these rectangles all over the place, distorts them uh, to follow certain uh, laws of science uh, of how to explain other artifacts, and it keeps trying to explain the data. Patterns like this that ex do explain the data well uh, will have a, have a higher likelihood, and their genotypes will have higher probability. If you took the bar from 17 and moved it over to 18, then a 16, 18 would have very low probability because it's not explaining the 17 peak and it's trying to put a lot of explanation where there's no data. So it just tries hundreds of thousands of different possibilities without looking at a suspect. When it's all done, it ends up with a probability distribution. Out of 100 possible allele pairs at this genetic locus, here are six of them, and one of them has most of the probability. That's the 1617, uh, which, as you recall, was the major contributor from the two tall peaks that corresponded to one person. So the computer thinks, as you might by looking at the pattern, uh, that most of the probability is on that 1617 allele pair from this particular locus from uh, the evidence. But it also gives about 10% of the probability to other possibilities because they're also possible, and it works out what they can be. There are cases where no probability ever goes higher than 25%. The evidence just isn't that clear. In this case, the evidence was uh, much clearer. So this is an objective genotype inferred from the evidence for one of the contributors at one of the loci. And now we're going to see how match information is calculated for this contributor at one locus. So what is a DNA match statistic? Uh, when you're in court, usually, you don't know. Somebody in a white coat comes in and says, uh, here's the table, here are alleles, this is my match statistic, and then they leave. Uh, there's not a lot of questioning about what it means or what is CPI, what is inclusion, uh, has it been validated, what is, that doesn't happen. Um, but it's not that hard, and conceptually, the match statistics of all methods, including CPI, follow the same rules. We're trying to ask a, answer a question about match information, where the, the matches, a match is the extent to which uh, two genotypes are equal. They can be sort of equal. They can be very unequal. They can be who knows, and that gives you more inclusionary information, exclusionary information, and indeterminate information. The specific question is, how much more does a suspect match the evidence than a random person, than a coincidence? What was the change in information? So this is the first time that we're introducing 
the, a suspect or some individual's genotype, the 1617, shown in red. What we're going to do is take a look at that blue distribution that we had before, which is from the evidence. What you're seeing in brown next to it is the random distribution from the population. There are a hundred possibilities. I'm only showing these six, but it would go around the courtroom to show you all the different possibilities and their probabilities. But for this comparison, only where the evidence is concentrated probability out of those hundred possibilities is relevant. Now, for the first time, let's look at the suspect. And the question is, at the genotype 1617, what is the ratio of, of genotype probability, which turns out to be the same as match probability in this case, between the, of the evidence shown in blue relative to uh, a random person shown in brown? And so that's 91% is the height of the blue bar. That's the amount of probability the evidence has placed on this contributor. And 11% is, the, is what a random person would have. If we just looked at this locus uh, from 100 people, say, in this room, 10 of them, on average, would be expected to have a 1617. That's a random person. That's the population. That ratio of those two numbers is around 8. And that's the change in information. That change of information is the max statistic, or the likelihood ratio. Doing it not just for one locus, but for all 15 loci, uh, the x-axis is showing the match statistic, 10, 20, 30, and so on. Now for all 15 loci, those numbers can be multiplied together uh, because the, the genetic locations are independent. So the laws of biology and probability let you multiply numbers together. And when it's done, one can answer the question, is the suspect in the evidence? To what extent? What's the number? And what it finds is that a match between the handgun and Leland Davis is 18 billion times more probable than a coincidental match uh, to an African American. And that's the entire process. It infers genotypes. It then asks what the information changes relative to um, a random person for the genotype of the defendant and produces a match statistic. I can also check for the baseball cap and answer uh, a match between the baseball cap and Leland Davis is uh, you know, 89 quadrillion times more probable than coincidence. Now the interesting bit in this case uh, from a technological perspective is how do you prove a negative? How do you establish that there's no scientific evidence to support the hypothesis that there's a second individual who contributed their DNA to both the hat and the gun. That can't be done by inclusion methods at all, but that can be done by genotyping methods by computer that separate out the genotypes. So if you have the gun and you separate out that mixture into three components, a first genotype, a second genotype, and a third genotype, and and you have the biological data from the hat and separate that out into three genotype components, the match statistics can be done between evidence and evidence as easily as between evidence and references. And so here's a table that shows here are the different components. Uh, the major component at 60% of the gun and 80% of the hat uh, did match Leland Davis. And we see that match again at the level of billions. But this is an evidence-to-evidence -evidence match. There's no people in here. We're saying, asking to what extent do the different genetic components of the gun match the different genetic components of the hat? And what you can see, where Leland Davis isn't, there's no support for a match. Those numbers are around zero or negative. There's no other number popping up, like six, meaning a million, or... Um, or nine, which would be a billion. These numbers are the number of zeros in the match statistic. There are nine zeros in the match statistic showing that the gun and the hat are connected. And this could be done uh, by a lab to connect evidence to evidence or by a, a truly old genotype database to connect evidence to evidence on a much larger scale. But there's no evidence at all that there's a second contributor 
that produces a positive match result. And that basically says that you're excluding the entire population in the sense. The evidence to evidence comparison produces um, no support for a second individual, only for the defendant. Uh, the verdict in this case was third degree murder and weapons charges. Uh, the sentence was 23 years. And there's a lot more about Truallele on our website. If you go to cybgen.com under information, there's CLEs, courses, articles, presentations, and we've gathered up about 50, over 50 presentations and put them on our YouTube channel for Truallele.